Hi, we're going to go over Chapter 35 in your Iggy book, Acute Coronary Syndromes. This involves uh, anything from a blockage in the coronary arteries to angina, which is chest pain, um, which can occur in an unstable fashion or a stable fashion. Um, and you need to know the difference between ischemia and infarction. Ischemia is when there is not enough oxygen to meet the requirements of the myocardium. And an infarction occurs when there is severe ischemia or it's gone on long enough that there is actually necrosis or cell death. Also known as angina or angina. This is characterized by episodes of pain or pressure in the anterior chest. People will talk about an elephant sitting on their chest or something of that nature. Um, and the cause is there's not enough oxygen to feed the coronary blood flow. So you have ischemia going on in the heart. Angina. Stable means that there is consistent pain and it occurs because of exertion. So somebody can be out trimming trees or mowing the lawn or maybe go to an exercise class and they start having chest pain, but when they stop their activity, the chest pain goes away. If it's unstable angina, the symptoms occur when people are at rest. So somebody may be sitting and watching television and they you know, can feel discomfort in their chest. Sometimes the patient will be asleep and it will actually wake them up out of a sound sleep. So if it's called new onset angina, or if that's the diagnosis, that means that they are just beginning to have the symptoms. So this is the first time they've had symptoms. If it's Prinzmental's angina, it is a pain at rest with ST elevation. Um, that is thought to be caused by spasms in the coronary muscles. Pre-infarction pain is pain that will occur and probably become more frequent and maybe more intense the closer and closer a person gets to actually having a myocardial infarction, which is why it is really important to teach people if they have chest pain and it keeps occurring, they need to be seen by a doctor. Intractable or refractory chest pain is severe and incapacitating chest pain. Um, this is when somebody is having a severe myocardial infarction um, and they're sweating and they're clutching their chest and they are just really um, miserable. They can't do anything but concentrate on this chest pain because it's so bad. And then there can be silent angina where you can see that there is ischemia happening on an EKG strip or 12 lead EKG, but the patient does not feel any pain. Very dangerous. What is the pathophysiology behind it? Well, atherosclerosis, which is a deposit of fatty material called plaque inside the inner walls of the arteries, that is atherosclerosis, that can cause a narrowing of the arteries or even a complete blockage of the blood flow. So that would cause chest pain, hypertension, coronary artery spasms, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a enlargening of the um, ventricles so that they are not pumping as they should. Factors associated with typical angina pain are physical exertion, exposure to cold, eating a heavy meal, and stress or emotion-provoking situation. So typically after a big holiday meal or a big meal after church on Sunday, um, especially one that is maybe a big steak or fried chicken or something um, will invoke chest pain in some people, um, exposure to cold or physical exertion. Also, people who are a type A personality, people who are real driven, um, always stressed out trying to meet the deadline or beat the deadline, um, or people who are under great stress at home because of, you know, maybe they're caring for a sick parent or a sick child. Maybe they're going through a divorce, or maybe they're in nursing school. Just kidding. Clinical manifestations of angina. The pain will vary from a feeling of indigestion to choking or heavy sensation in the upper chest. 
So it can be something that mimics indigestion, where it's just kind of a mild discomfort, it's kind of aggravating, um, all the way to a really agonizing pain where, um, like I said, sometimes they'll, they'll describe it as an elephant sitting on their chest. So that's a lot of pressure, okay, that they're trying to describe. Um, and also a feeling of impending doom, a lot of anxiety, a lot of apprehension. They also may feel numbness and tingling in the arms. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear people describe a, a pain radiating down their left arm, and they that will be accompanied by numbness in the left arm. Um, they may also have tachycardia, palpitations, shortness of breath, and of course, dizziness, diaphoresis, difficulty breathing, and they may have nausea and vomiting and, and anxiety. An important manifestation of angina is that it abates or subsides with rest or nitroglycerin, and we'll talk about nitroglycerin under the tongue, the sublingual nitro, in just a minute. There are different considerations and risks because somebody who's older doesn't feel the same sensations as well. Um, they also have just normal hardening of the arteries and their valves don't work as well, that type thing. So often they may not feel the typical pain and pressure because their neurotransmitters operate differently, okay, just due to the aging process. This doesn't even include diseases such as diabetes and things, hypertension, that add to the changes um, in us geriatrically, okay. So often a patient who is older may not feel that chest pressure as much, but they may be very short of breath. Often they will complain of dizziness as well. Um, and maybe fatigue, or they just can't get up and move like they used to. Um, risk factors, we have non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. And I think you guys have a good idea of what that means. If it's non-modifiable, it cannot be changed. So things like age, race, ethnicity, um, modifiable are level of activity, exercise, um, smoking, Hypertension to a degree is modifiable. Um, your nutrition and diet, uh, cholesterol levels, the happy or good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol is inversely related to the risk for developing CAD. So if you have a low happy cholesterol number, um, there is a greater risk for you having or developing cardiac disease. An assessment. As far as medical management, medications are giving, given that decrease the workload of the heart. Okay, so they decrease the oxygen demand of the myocardium. Also, increase oxygen supply. How would that happen? Well, if you have a medication that dilates the blood vessels, that is going to increase the amount of blood flowing, and it's also going to make it easier for the blood to flow because the vessel is enlarged, okay? It's wider. So therefore, there is a greater oxygen supply, okay? The blood pressure will be lower. Um, the heart rate will be lower. So that decreases the oxygen demand of the heart and gives a better supply because the vessels are wider and more blood flows more easily, okay? As far as the assessment, you guys are probably here in my dishwasher. I apologize. Okay, now it's quiet again. <laughs> okay, our assessment diagnostically, we have an EKG that we do. You know about the 12 lead EKG. You know the exercise stress test is where people um, are hooked up to a 12 lead EKG, but they are on a treadmill and they are exercising. This way we can see if there is any ischemia going on as the oxygen supply or, or the oxygen demand is increased by the exercise that somebody is doing, okay? Then we have the stress echocardiogram where we are looking at the heart while um, somebody is exercising, again on the treadmill, and we're um, recording what the valves are doing. We're watching the blood flow of the heart. Um, it's like an ultrasound. Um, the echocardiogram is like an ultrasound. 
coronary angiogram and the cardiac catheterization where we actually are feeding a catheter up into the heart and injecting dye so that we can see um, any blockages in the vessels and see what's really going on. The cardiac catheterization is the definitive and also the most invasive cardiac tests that they can do. As I mentioned, we were going to talk more about nitrates, nitroglycerin, in the treatment of angina. Nitrostat is just a you know, shorter term for nitroglycerin. Um, it is given sublingually, typically, okay, so it goes under the tongue. It is vasoactive. It um, decreases myocardial oxygen consumption, which decreases ischemia, therefore relieving the pain that somebody is having because of the ischemia. And how it does that is it dilates those blood vessels. That, that's what vasoactive means, okay? So it dilates those blood vessels, it widens them, therefore decreasing the blood pressure and uh, making the oxygen, oxygenated blood flow more freely, okay? Usual routes are sublingual, that's under the tongue. Also, you can give it as a spray. There is also a topical version, and you can also give it intravenously. Now, if you're giving it IV, it is given in a glass bottle, okay? Um, it is known as a nitro drip. Typically, this is done in the ICU or CCU um, because a person will need careful monitoring um, during that IV infusion. For anginal pain, the patient is instructed to take one tablet under the tongue every five minutes, up to three tablets for relief of pain, and if no relief, call 911. I always told my patients, if you're on your second nitro and you're not getting any relief, you need to go ahead and be calling the ambulance um, because it's probably not going away. Also important to note, before giving a patient nitroglycerin, ask if they have taken Viagra or Cialis in the past 24 hours. That is because the um, medications for erectile dysfunction have a vasodilating effect. So if you um, give nitroglycerin on top of those ED medications, this will result in severe hypotension. So you don't want to do that and make your patient pass out and feel miserable. Usually it's IV drip to prevent blood clots. It is used when someone is having an MI or when they have angina and there is a possibility that they're having an MI. Heparin therapy is Consider therapeutic when the PTT or INR is 1.5 to 2 times the normal. So the PTT INR is what we use to make sure it's a uh, lab draw, lab blood draw that we use to make sure that the heparin is therapeutic. It is given in units per hour, um, always given via pump, uh, IV pump, and again monitored with the PTT INR. The low molecular weight heparin is given sub-Q. It is typically Lovenox is the name of it, and it's given sub-Q. You don't have to keep drawing the PTT to monitor the level. Um, it is very stable and more effective. People can give it at home if needed, um, but the heparin drip is more therapeutic when somebody is actually having an MI so you'll see somebody on a heparin drip while they're in the cath lab um, or after they come out, after they have had a stent put in, and then eventually the heparin drip will be changed to either sub-Q heparin or the um, Lovenox sub-Q. Heparin and Lovenox, obviously because they're blood thinners, they increase the risk of bleeding. So the patient needs to be monitored closely and they need to be taught, um, you know, they, they're going to bleed more easily if they shave. So we recommend the um, electric razor rather than a straight or, you know, blade. Um, also, as a nurse, we want to make sure that if you take out an IV or if you give an injection to somebody who is on heparin and Lovenox, or one or the other, you need to hold pressure longer at the site 
where you've taken out a needle, okay? Um, avoid IM injections if possible. You want to stick to the sub-Q or PO route for medications. And also teach people that they're going to bruise more easily. And also, they need to be on fall precautions because if they fall, um, they may have an internal bleed much more easily because they're on a blood thinner. And people actually have died from that. administered at the onset of chest pain in an in tip attempt to increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the myocardium and decrease the pain. We want to make sure their pulse ox is greater than 90. Um, this is 93%. You know, somebody who doesn't have COPD, you want, you expect it and want it to be around 95 to 100, hopefully, um, especially with the delivery of oxygen via nasal cannula. Um, I always think this is kind of funny. Back in 1990, when I started nursing, there were studies done that showed that oxygen didn't really help when somebody had chest pain. But I don't think we ever stopped the practice of putting on oxygen when people were having chest pain. And it does certainly seem to help them. Nothing other than to make them feel better, you know, mentally. <laughs> Myocardial infarction. What are the causes? Well, it can either be the atherosclerosis, which is that buildup of plaque in a coronary artery, or the um, plaque can rupture and a piece breaks off, which then occludes the artery. You can have a blood clot, which breaks off um, and flows up into that plaque and occludes the blood flow, occludes the artery. Uh, also, Shock or hemorrhage, which would be a problem with the clotting um, and causing the, the platelet aggregation, which again occludes the artery. The physiology of an MI. One or more coronary arteries become occluded. If the occlusion is lasting longer than 30 to 45 minutes, you will have irreversible myocardial cell damage and muscle death that will occur. Um, when you have an MI, there is a central area of necrosis or death, uh, dead tissue, surrounded by an area of injury, hypoxic injury. This injured area is potentially viable. Um, so you have an area of ischemia and then injury and then where uh, necrosis, where the cell death has occurred. That area where the cell death has occurred is potentially never coming back, okay? But if circulation is restored um, and perfusion is, is good, you can restore some of that area where there has been um, an injury, okay? So some of those cells are going to regenerate um, and come back to life. The heart initially after an MI, um, it's called stunned. Um, in that area of injury. So when they initially do an echocardiogram or when they're in the cath lab doing the heart catheterization, they will actually be able to estimate the ejection fraction. Okay, so it may be, say, 40 um, or even, you know, 38, 35, really low initially after the MI. They will wait a month to three months do an echocardiogram and they will be able to see if the myocardium where it was stunned is going to re, um, reinvigorate, okay? That ejection fraction may go way up after, after the MI, after a few months of recovery. So it may go up to say 50, 55, 60%, okay? Um, there can be a great deal of healing that happens um, or there, there may be minimal healing. It depends on the area the infarct occurred and how long the myocardium was without oxygen. And it also can depend on the age of the person and the comorbidities that they have. Signs and symptoms of a heart attack. If you haven't seen it live and in person or don't know anyone that's had a heart attack, Certainly in the movies and on television, you've seen somebody having a heart attack. So dyspnea, 
sweating, nausea, extreme restlessness, along with the chest pain or neck pain or pain going down the arm or pain in, uh, in the back area, tachycardia, hypertension, or bradycardia and hypotension if the person is having an, an MI in the inferior part of the heart. That is the um, signs and symptoms you'll see. Sometimes you'll hear the S3 or S4 and along with the S1 and S2 sounds. Um, also, you may see um, ventricular tachycardia or some kind of um, problem with the rhythm of the heart. You may hear a murmur or a rub. Also, people possibly may have a low-grade fever. Um, another thing to note is that in women, um, there are different differences in the signs and symptoms. Typically, a woman will um, have a lot of anxiety and apprehension. She may describe flu-like symptoms and will often report pain in the back as opposed to the front anterior chest. We're going to ask the patient about their history. Have they ever had any heart problems before? Have they ever had an MI? Have they ever had stents? What is their family history like? Um, because typically that there is a strong genetic association with cardiac disease. So if your dad had cardiac disease, it is very likely that you're going to have it especially if your grandparents also had it, okay? Or if your mother had it, or if your mom has hypertension, or your dad has hypertension, it's very likely that you're going to have it, okay? A 12-lead EKG tells us a whole lot of information, okay? It, it can show even an old heart attack. Um, sometimes people have heart attacks and they don't even know it, but it will show up on their 12-lead EKG. It can show if there is current ischemia going on. It can show if there's any um, problems with rhythm or heart rate. And it can also tell us where in the heart there is ischemia or a problem going on. An echocardiogram is another assessment that we do that is, um, I think I've told you before, it's like an ultrasound that a pregnant woman would get, it, it, but instead they're looking at the heart and they're seeing the valves move. They can even see if there's any vegetation that has grown on the valves or if there's any leaking of the valves. And it shows the blood moving through the atria and the ventricle and being pumped out so we can see um, the ejection fraction. We can see how well the pump is is happening in the heart. Labs that happen or that we do are cardiac markers, um, the creatinine kinase, CK and CKMB used to be um, the gold standard. Now we have even better um, enzymes that we look at, but the, some cardiologists still follow the creatinine kinase. Okay, it is cardiac specific and it is found um, when there is damage to the myocardial cells, okay? And it will peak 20, excuse me, 12 to 24 hours after an MI, and it will return to normal within two to three days. MB part of the CKMB I was talking about. So if you see that in somebody's labs, when you're in clinical, you'll know what they're talking about. The myoglobin is a heme protein that actually transports the oxygen, okay? It is found in cardiac and skeletal muscle, and it will increase um, early after the onset of symptoms of an MI. It will peak in four to eight hours and will return to normal in 24 hours. It takes only a few minutes to run a CKMB, so it's kind of, um, you know, easy to see, okay? A troponin, however, is what is most used nowadays a protein found in the myocardium. Um, it elevates as early as one hour post-injury. Um, it peaks in 10 to 24 hours and will remain elevated for a period of time up to 20 days. It is considered the gold standard for identifying an MI and cardiac injury. Um, it can identify small infarcts. 
which have been undetected by conventional diagnostic methods. So um, the troponin is easy for them to see. It peaks, or excuse me, it el starts elevating quickly within an hour, um, and there will be a trend, so it will be, um, the lab will be repeated every three to six hours when somebody has had an MI. We want to see how high it peaks, and then we want to see it coming down. Um, LDH you may see, but this is an old test that is not typically used anymore. Therapy for an MI is similar to those with the unstable angina. Um, there will also be given a thrombolytic agent and also an ACE inhibitor, an angiotensin converting enzyme. That is the ACE inhibitor. The thrombolytic agents are usually given within 30 minutes of arrival to the ER. Their purpose is to dissolve any blood clot, also known as a thrombus, in a coronary artery, therefore reestablishing blood flow through that artery and minimizing the effects, the size, and consequences of an infarction. We want to preserve ventricular function, okay? Obviously, we want to preserve the pump of the heart and minimize um, the necrotic area. Um, if they dissolve a thrombus, that doesn't affect the underlying problems that cause, caused the thrombus to be able to lodge in the coronary artery. So it's not going to change the plaque, okay? So they're going to have to do more um, than just dissolving the blood clot. So they will have a cardiac catheterization, um, and from that they can do interventions to help with that plaque that's built up in the artery. We are going to give thrombolytic agents. This will dissolve a clot that is causing NMI. Typically today we give TPA or Altapase as the um, plasminogen uh, activator. We do not give streptokinase as much um, nowadays, but that was the original thrombolytic agent that used to always be given. Um, it just doesn't do as good of a job. So, Also, we give low molecular weight heparin, which we've talked about. The Lovenox is real easy to give. Um, allergic reactions are less. However, it is more costly than the TPA. The thing about thrombolytic agents that you need to know is there are reasons that we would not give a thrombolytic agent. So you need to know the uh, excuse me, contraindications. This is found in your text. Things such as a recent GI bleed, recent brain bleed. Um, so just make sure you know that. Medications are we going to use when somebody is having an MI? When they come into the emergency room with chest pain, they're going to be given aspirin, nitroglycerin, usually under the tongue, you're going to put some oxygen on them and give them morphine IV. So you're going to go ahead and be starting that IV, put that oxygen on while they've got that aspirin in their mouth. We usually have them chew, the, chew it up, put the nitro under their tongue, see if we can get that chest pain relieved. Um, remember, they can have it for three doses every five minutes. We're going to be watching their blood pressure, um, and then we're going to give them some morphine through that IV if the blood, uh, excuse me, if the chest pain has not resolved. We're also going to be giving them a thrombolytic. We're going to be giving them a beta blocker, such as Lopressor or Coreg. We are going to be giving them an ACE inhibitor, okay? The um, ACE inhibitor, inhibitor, excuse me, is given within 48 hours of having a myocardial infarction. Something that may be um, difficult for some people is it causes a dry cough. It's a very common side effect from an ACE inhibitor. Um, the calcium channel blockers such as Procardia, Norvasc, or Verapamil, all of those can be given. Also, antiarrhythmics. If they're, if the MI has caused some arrhythmias, and we want to um, protect the patient from 
throwing a blood clot or going into ventricular tachycardia, we are going to give amiodarone, lidocaine, and even magnesium. Also heparin IV, we talked about that, and stool softeners are usually given. Any of you have been who have been in clinical already know that stool softeners are just standard, right? <laughs> We're going to be making sure those people can have a bowel movement without having to strain um, because we don't want somebody um, straining, bearing down. Remember that is a known as a vagal maneuver. If somebody's having extreme tachycardia, we will want them to bear down as if they're having a bowel movement to cause that heart rate to drop. Um, but if they're already on you know, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors or calcium channel blockers that are going to cause them to have a lower heart rate anyway, we don't want them to be constipated and be having to bear down, which would ca may cause them to have further um, bradycardia. For invasive management. So when they do a heart catheterization, if they find that there is a blockage in a coronary artery that is occluding blood flow. They can do what is known as a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, also known as PTCA or a balloon. Okay, They will put a balloon up into the artery and inflate it. This pushes the plaque out of the way. Okay, um, After the balloon is deflated, they can put a stent where that balloon was inflated to hold that plaque back, okay, to keep it um, out of the way and allow blood to flow easily. They can also do an atherectomy, which is known as a rotor-rooter, where they go in and they have a little like drill type thing that actually spins and then the plaque is sucked out. Those pieces of plaque that are broken up are then sucked out of the artery and taken out, okay. Brachytherapy is uh, radiation to the area with the stent. Um, I have not seen that done, but apparently that is something that they can also do. Of a balloon being put into the artery, you can see where the blockage is. Bl the balloon in the first picture in the artery is not inflated and they're just inserting it into the area that needs to be inflated. Then they inflate it, and then they deflate it again and remove it. After they, they let it sit for a few seconds to flatten out that plaque against the wall. And what used to happen before we had the invention of the stent was sometimes the, the plaque would just fall back into the artery and re-occlude it, um, and that is called re-stenosis. <clears throat> And so the stent was invented that could be left in the artery to hold that plaque pushed back away from the wall. Go in and do a heart cath and see the blockages. And either they're so bad that a stent wouldn't help, or there are so many, or they're in such a place in the artery where it's really difficult to get to with the stent um, and and for the you know for the stent to remain open so then they have to do what is known as a cabbage a coronary artery bypass graft okay this is a surgery where they go in and open up the sternum um, and they actually put the patient on the heart lung machine so while the heart is being worked on, it has to be stopped. It can't pump. So the heart-lung machine, actually, the blood is run through that in order to oxygenate the blood and act as the heart and lung do, okay? So that the patient can remain alive while the surgery is being done. Um, so they will bypass the area of the occlusion in the coronary artery and actually attach uh, a new route for the blood to go through. Okay, so that that's what they're doing when a cabbage is done, a coronary artery bypass graft. And they may bypass one artery, two, three, four, or five. Okay, um, 
the more that's done at one time, the more serious the surgery is, obviously. Okay. Um, there is some, you know, intense rehabilitation that's done afterwards. Um, now they get the patient up, I think, the day after. Um, or maybe if it's done in the morning, and it takes hours to do the surgery, but they may get them up that night. Um, it's amazing how fast they get people moving uh, after big surgeries like that now.